Thank you, everybody, for uh, coming today. My name is Mo Alethi, and I am the executive director of the Institute of Politics and Public Service at the McCourt School. And we uh, are just thrilled to be one of the sponsoring organizations for today's event, along with um, uh, a number of other uh, Georgetown and McCourt School affiliated student groups, um, which is very exciting and the uh, support of the US Conference of Mayors. Uh, I think we'll have uh, someone else who'll come up here and talk about all the other groups. But uh, at the Institute of Politics and Public Service, we're new. We are now in our second semester uh, of existence. And it is really, um, we exist to have conversations like this one, uh, where we are talking about the practical implications of policy and pulling back the curtain and talking with the people who actually do it about the how and the why and how it's actually done. Uh, and I'm, I'm excited to hear that from, from this panel. Uh, let me say a quick word about how this came together because it's actually very, uh, very interesting. It's a good segue to the other real reason I'm standing up here right now. Um, this event was an idea generated by McCourt School students who came to us and said, hey, we noticed the US Conference of Mayors is meeting next month in Washington. We'd love to actually bring a number of the mayors together to have a conversation about economic policy and the politics around it. And we said, wow, that's a great idea. I wish we had thought of it. And so we brainstormed how we were gonna get it done, how we were gonna pull these mayors together. We had just selected our spring class of fellows, one of whom is a former mayor. Alvin Brown of Jacksonville, Florida. So we thought, okay, well, no one can tell us how to get a bunch of mayors better than a mayor. So we called Alvin and Alvin said, sure, let me get on that. And he made one phone call to Tom Cochran of the US Conference of Mayors. Within 48 hours, this panel had been pulled together, which tells me two things. One, um, it's good to know people. And two, uh, that mayors across the country listen to what Tom Cochran tells them. <laughs> uh, Tom Cochran, uh, I wanna bring up here very briefly because it is in the middle of the US Conference of Mayors uh, meeting here in Washington, so he's a very busy man. Um, uh, and we wouldn't be here with this panel if it were not for him. The uh, he is the executive director of the US Conference of Mayors, which is the official nonpartisan organization representing the country's mayors and cities. Tom is uh, a bit of an anomaly. He's been with the organization for 47 years and is executive director of it for nearly 30 years. I was 12 when I came. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's just a, a, a tremendous resource. You cannot talk to a mayor or a chief of staff who has served at any point during that time span who doesn't just smile when they hear Tom's name and, and talk about what a tremendous resource and advocate he is for America's cities, our mayors, uh, and an agenda that will move cities forward. And so I'm gonna ask uh, Tom to come up here and say a few words and thank you for your support in this event. Uh, thank you, Mo, and, and thank you, uh, Sophie, and thank you, all the mayors who responded. Uh, let me let me just quickly say, as uh, Mo has mentioned, I got 300 mayors over in the hotel. I've never left a winter meeting. You can ask these guys and and Mayor Nan. We've been here since 1932, when mayors met with Roosevelt and Rinda Brownstone during the Great Depression. And we have been here representing mayors since that time. And during these years, we have established relationships with um, NYU, which is, I think Mayor Cornette is a graduate, with the NYU school, named after Mayor Wagner, NYU uh, New York, and NYU Florence. Let me tell you, that's sweet, you know? And also, <laughs> of course, with the JFK school, and with the LBJ school, et cetera, et cetera. But I want to just tell you how happy I am that y'all are here. And the thing that, that, that makes my heart feel so good is the students 
mayors, recognize that you're in town. We're here, we've been here since 32, and we're gonna to continue to be here. So I'm pleased to be here on behalf of the nation's mayors and our president, Stephanie Rollins Blake of Baltimore, to say uh, this is the beginning, this is our first time, but not our last. So uh, with that, uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing that gets me more excited than young people. I was, I was a boy in Georgia at 14 when I saw JFK on TV. And th at that point, I said, I've got to be a part of something. And so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a kid that saw him and got involved in, 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 in public service. And that's what is so beautiful about the mayors. You can work for a congressman, you can work for a governor, but when you're working with a mayor, you're making changes in people's lives and also creating beautiful cities like we have right now. So this is the beginning. I look forward to working with all of you and I'm humbled to say thank you for inviting us and let's keep going. And I appreciate very much. So y'all have a good show here today. You got some of the best. I, I could talk about them, but somebody's gonna introduce them. So with that, thank you again. And, and we now have the Mayor District of Columbia coming in and she's gonna be a part of this, uh, this, this uh, panel too. So thank you and I look forward to working with all of you in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, everyone. My good name is afternoon. Jessica. Um, I'm the president of the McCourt student body. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. And welcome to you, Mayor Bowser. Thank you. Um, in recent years, the rise of income inequality has been a recurring theme in policy debates and political dialogue at all levels of government. However, the gridlock in Washington has caused us to rely more and more on mayors and cities to drive growth and innovation and to restore economic opportunity for all. The students of the Georgetown Public Policy Student Association, the Georgetown Public Policy Review, and the McCourt Policy Innovation Lab would like to invite you all to engage with us today in an interactive discussion with our panelists. We hope you will emerge with a better understanding of the complexities of policymaking at the local level and with insight into best practices for improving economic mobility in communities across the country. On behalf of all McCourt students, I would like to thank our partners, the McCourt School of Public Policy, the Georgetown Institute of Politics and Public Service, and the Baker Center for Leadership and Governance for making this event possible. I would also like to thank the U.S. Conference of Mayors uh, for their partnership in organizing this event. As we all prepare for our own careers as policymakers and politicians, it is really an invaluable opportunity for us to have access to city leaders who are addressing the most pressing policy challenges of our time firsthand. I would now like to introduce our moderators for the panel. We have two moderators, Mayor Alvin Brown and our very own GPPR Editor-in-Chief, Aaron Mullally. Mayor Brown governed Jacksonville, Florida for the past four years as the first ever African American elected mayor of Jacksonville and the first Democratic mayor in 20 years. With bold and collaborative approaches to the challenges of economic development, Mayor Brown implemented numerous new programs to put Jacksonville at the forefront of policy innovation. Prior to his tenure as mayor, he served as Vice President Al Gore's Senior Advisor for Urban Policy. Mayor Brown also served as senior advisor to the late Commerce Secretary Ron Brown and senior advisor to U.S. Secretary of Housing and Urban Development Andrew Cuomo. He hopes to share his passion for public service as a GU Politics Fellow here at Georgetown, leading a discussion group this semester entitled Successes and Struggles of a 21st Century Mayor. Aaron Mullally, our GPPR Editor-in-Chief, grew up in the state capital of Missouri, Jefferson City, and attended the University of Missouri Columbia, where she received an honors degree in political science. Prior to the McCourt School, she spent three years working for the city of Kansas City, Missouri, serving as a communications and public affairs aide for one of our panelists today, Mayor James. So you can expect some favoritism in her questioning. <laughs> <laughs> that would be. <laughs> 
At McCourt, her focus is on politics and the media and labor policy. As editor-in-chief of the Georgetown Public Policy Review, Erin and her staff launched a series this past fall on state and local innovation. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Erin to introduce our panelists. Thanks, Jess. And uh, to start off, I just want to echo what Mo said. We are so excited to have you all here at Georgetown today. We know how busy you are at your winter meeting, and we feel like we put together an all-star squad. And on Twitter, they call that squad goals. So you can use, you can use that hashtag. Um, <laughs> so to my right, I would like to introduce the Honorable Mick Cornett, Mayor of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Mayor Muriel Bowser of Washington, D.C., and from Kansas City, Missouri, and home of the world champion Kansas City Royals, Amen. the honor, <laughs> the honorable Sly James, <laughs> and Mayor Nan Whaley, Mayor of Dayton, Ohio, and my co-moderator, Mayor Alvin Brown. Um, so I want to start off our first question by acknowledging that while the four of you come from unique and diverse cities, um, at the core of urban policy in America is the recognition that there are some deep-seated issues um, that are difficult to solve but common among many cities. Two of these that are commonly discussed are the high concentration of crime and poverty and the lack of educational opportunity. Um, so my question is, to build a city of economic opportunity, you really need to be addressing these, these core issues. Um, so starting with Mayor Cornett, um, I would like to hear from each of you. What is your administration doing to address these issues? You're talking about income inequality? Income inequality, um, urban crime, lack mm -hmm. of educational opportunity and mobility. Well, yeah, they're just like every other city, uh, you know, the s social issues that you mentioned all exist in Oklahoma City. If, if we're fortunate in some of those categories, we have just about the lowest <laughs> unemployment in the country. Uh, last time I checked, we had the lowest African-American unemployment rate in the country. Housing prices are low. I know in the Brookings Institute did a study on inequality about five years ago. We had the, we ranked number one. We were the least, we had the least issue of any major city in, in America. Um, I have a bigger issue with my microphone. But <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it me? Is it? Phone. It's your phone. If it's near it, sometimes it like goes. What I, have, what I have noticed in Oklahoma City is we have sort of this unannounced strategy to rely heavily on philanthropic efforts when it comes to deal with a lot of issues like homelessness and hunger um, and uh, uh, mental illness. And I, I think one of the reasons that the model seems to have worked well for us is that these are all services that traditionally government has not ex excelled at addressing. And when you're talking about a person that's, that's at that intersection of homelessness or uh, poverty and, and mental illness, that person most likely needs an individual answer, an individual solution. And government's not good at individual solutions. Government's good at a policy that everybody can understand and adhere to and follow. But I do think that the faith-based organizations and the philanthropic organizations are in a better situation to try and address a lot of these individual issues. Um, you know, when we decided to take on veterans' homelessness, incredible, uh, you know, achievements in, in the, in the number-wise. And, and so, you know, it's all a work in progress. You know, a mayor never wakes up and said, okay, well, that, that, one's, that one's done. Now I can move on to something else. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a daily issue. But, but I, I do think that, that, uh, that our efforts to try and keep taxes low but try to get the, the philanthropy and a strong economy to support the social organizations that can help us with a lot of these issues is a model that's worked for us. And, uh, and uh, I'm not saying it's a universal model, but it's, it's worked in Oklahoma City, and, and it's probably at least partially uh, uh, attr attributed to our success. Well, 
Well, I, I, would, I think I would step back from your question a little bit um, because when we think about uh, cities, uh, I don't think that we concentrate on problems as much as we concentrate on our ability uh, to be innovators and actually get things done. Um, when, the, when the president introduced uh, this panel, she talked about gridlock in Washington. And what I want to be real clear about, she wasn't talking about Washington, D.C., <laughs> local Washington. She was talking about federal Washington, because what, uh, what the gridlock in federal Washington has demonstrated to all of us is that mayors have to do things because we don't have the, uh, we don't have the ability to push it off on anybody else. Uh, the residents are counting on us for public safety for investments in affordable housing, for schools that work to pick up the trash and to move the snow. Uh, and we have, and I just feel very privileged to be a mayor at this time, uh, where we can actually push innovation um, up uh, through our system um, and really call on and call out um, the federal government in some ways for, for not doing the things uh, that, that are so important. Uh, so we were in a place in our city where income inequality is really front and center and it's one of the, the major reasons why I ran for mayor and believe I was elected uh, is because people love the prosperity that's happening in Washington. The renaissance in Washington has been tremendous and none of us long for the days when uh, we were the murder capital or we were broke or the Congress took us over. Nobody longs for those days. Um, but at the same time, there's a huge anxiety about uh, who will benefit uh, from the transformation of Washington and if the people who stuck around for the hard times will be able uh, to enjoy the good times. Um, so the, the success that we've had as a city has enabled us uh, to double down in some cases on uh, investments in the human services. Because we have been successful uh, and have a thousand people choosing to live here every single month, a lot of them from Georgetown, I, I, would, I would guess. Um, and we want you to keep choosing to live here. Uh, but uh, so we, because of that, that success, we've been able to make huge investments um, in our city. So I'll, I'll talk about three big things that our administration has done in the last year and will continue continue to do. Um, the first one being a $100 million per year commitment to affordable housing. We have in the district a tool called the Housing Production Trust Fund. Uh, it is, we have a dedicated revenue source uh, coming from our deed and recordation taxes uh, that we say goes into this fund and the city steps in as a, a gap financer for, for economic development projects that produce uh, below market rate housing. Uh, it's an uneven fund from deed and recordation. Some years it's been um, very close to 100 million, other years like last year it was only 55 million. So my commitment is to make up um, that gap and put $100 million uh, in that investment. Uh, we're also very focused on youth employment, uh, and it has been, we have had various levels of success um, in Washington, D.C. With, with youth employment. While we have seen unemployment go down in the last year in our city, uh, it has been very stubborn um, in parts of our city, and so there's still a lot more that we have to do. I actually uh, inherited, uh, when I became mayor, uh, a it's a distinction that mayors don't want. I'm on a list with the federal government at the Department of Labor uh, that says we have to do better with youth employment programs. So two things that we've done in the past year was expand our summer youth program to include young people up to age 24 uh, and also uh, to have a year-round program that trains at-risk youth um, for, for jobs in our city. Uh, the last thing I'll mention uh, about it is uh, folks who are really, really uh, at the, the bottom of our income scale, no income and no home. Uh, and we have decided in our city that a, a city as prosperous as ours can end homelessness um, and make the occurrence of homelessness uh, rare and brief. And if somebody falls into an emergency, we hope that they never experience it again. Uh, so we have embarked on a, a five-year plan uh, that's multi-million dollars in uh, tens of million dollars every year uh, to get us towards that goal that involves transitional housing, rapid rehousing, uh, and uh, emergency housing. And uh, the residents of the District of Columbia, taxpayers in particular, have been willing to step up uh, and make that an investment 
in um, helping people get on the right path. And I, I noticed that we have some of our Georgetown ANC commissioners uh, in Washington. I think everybody knows here for our panelists in Washington, uh, we have a position, an elected position called Advisory Neighborhood Commissioner. Uh, and they serve each 2,000 residents as volunteers. Uh, but they, they take on a lot of stuff sometimes, uh, advise the government, and really help us make some, some uh, decisions that move the district forward. Um, well, first of all, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, one thing I love about being in, on a college campus is the ability to have free flowing thought. So I'm going to step back a little bit because although I respect the question, the question dealt with symptoms. It didn't deal with the problem. Uh, the problems, and I think Dr. Martin Luther King said it best in that period of time after the I Have a Dream speech where we each know one line, uh, because most of the time nobody's actually ever read the entire speech, but we all know that it's about the content of character, not the color of skin, but nobody knows anything else about it. The week after he gave that speech, he was set to give a sermon, and he was, not the week after that, the week after he was assassinated, he was set to give a sermon. And in that sermon, he said that there were three things that he believed challenged and may ultimately doom the democracy of the America that we know. One, racism. Two, poverty. Three, militarism. I think that those things are still at the heart of most of our issues in this country right now. Um, education, housing, poverty, all of those things are born of something. And we need to address those core illnesses before we can get rid of the symptoms. So going beyond the, I've said what I need to say about the illnesses, we can have a conversation about that on another line. But to deal specifically with the question asked, there are a number of things that a number of mayors do. And first and foremost, let me just say this, mayors matter, okay? Mayors matter. And the reason mayors matter is because we are the ones that you see meeting with their constituents and their citizens every single day. Go to the grocery store? Yes. Ever get stopped in the aisle? Yes. Here's my favorite thing. Go to the grocery store, I get stopped in the aisle, and somebody walks up to me and says, Mayor, you do your own shopping? And I say, I do my own eating. <laughs> <laughs> no. What do you expect me to do? No, I have somebody that I pay on my mayor's salary to go shop for me. <laughs> yeah, that helps. But the bottom line is, is that we have to get things done and we have to be responsive to the needs. The problem is, is that we don't have all the resources that we need to do it. Um, I don't know how other people feel about their states, but I will say quite frankly that I consider our state legislature almost the enemy. They, they really want to preempt us from doing anything that helps our citizens because they have a political agenda that they're pushing. And it doesn't include helping the poor and eliminating racism and fully funding education. So what do we do? In Kansas City, Missouri, it's 318 square miles, 475,000 people, a density of about 1,460 people per square mile. That's not much. Comparison? Um... Manhattan, 38,000 per square mile. L.A., 29,000 per square mile. Think of each of those people in that square mile as $1 to take care of the needs of that square mile. So we have 1,460, Manhattan has 38, L.A. has 29, all right? So with those funds that we have, we have to provide exactly the same services as these other cities. In Kansas City, we also have 15 school districts in whole or in part in that city. Just to give you a size or an example of how big the city is, San Francisco would fit eight times in Kansas City. You can live downtown and overlook the river in a studio apartment. You can drive 20 minutes, and you can have 20 acres and a horse or a mule. Just depends on what you want to do. It's that big. But in that process, in those 15 school districts, we have all sorts of variations in the quality of schools. And as you might expect, the school that is blackest and brown, the school district that's blackest and brownest is the, ones, it's the one that struggles the most. So in trying to address the issues of education, we knew that we could not do it on a school district by school district basis. What we decided to do was, again, let's attack the root problem. Our children are not ready for kindergarten. In most instances, they're not. And one of the reasons they're not registered or ready for kindergarten is because of the 30 million word gap. The 30 million word gap basically tells us that children raised in poverty, born into poverty, will hear 30 million words less than their same counterparts born in more affluent circumstances. Now think about it. 
child by the time they're three years old, by the way. So if you're hearing 30 million words less, there's two things going on. Nobody is spending much time with you, so you're not going to be socialized very well. Or if they are spending time with you and you're still not hearing words, it's because the only words that you're hearing are no, stop, don't do that, boy, if you don't get away from there, I'm going to. Okay, those types of things. That's not what we need. That's not what we're talking about. So we have to cure that gap in order to have a fighting chance to get them ready for kindergarten. If we can get them ready for kindergarten through quality early childhood education, which most places don't have. Mick, do you have it across the board? You, you passed the tax for it. No. You didn't? You paid no. out of budget? <laughs> we, n nonprofits that helped help the help okay us well we're in the process of trying to do it there's a lot of different ways to attack it but let's put it this way early childhood education is an expensive thing to do because it's labor intensive and you have to have quality teachers on that level to do it so what we've done is is that we started in 2011 turn the page KC it is a program that is designed specifically to accomplish one very basic goal with three tenants in order to do that one we are going to try to make sure that every child across the city has, uh, it reads proficiently by the time they finish third grade. Because up to third grade, you're learning to read. From third grade on, you're reading to learn. Those who have not learned to read proficiently by the time they're finished third grade, 75% do not catch up. And a large percentage of those who did not catch up don't graduate from high school. And a large percentage of those who do not graduate from high school wind up in the system in some form or fashion or dead, or at best in a lot of instances, underemployed and under able to compete. So if we want to change the trajectory of poverty and education and all of those things that you want to be interested in, we must first go back and attack the root problems. We must go back to the foundations and stabilize them. We must understand that children are the future of this country, 100%. Not much of the population, but they're 100% of the future. So we have to address that issue. With regards to housing and poverty, we all have various programs that address those, different strokes, different things. We have something called KC Cure, Kansas City Catalytic Urban Redevelopment Program, where we are collecting patient capital. And by patient capital, we're talking about tens of millions of dollars that you can invest in catalytic urban redevelopment projects in the core of the city without somebody looking for a two, three, four, five, ten year return on the investment. Because you, you're Mayor. not going to get that return. Thank you. Thank you. I'm stopping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, That's Nan. Well, Sorry I, about that. No, no, so I like it when you get excited. So uh, <laughs> you feel the love here, yeah. the energy. Well, I just want to thank everyone for inviting us today to uh, the Franklin Court School in Georgetown. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I come from a town called Dayton, Ohio. Um, has anybody been there? All right. Wow. Sweet. You know, home of the Wright brothers and still doing lots of aerospace innovation. Don't let Marco Rubio tell you any different. As he said, they were from North Carolina. Uh, so uh, the innovation, innovation started in Dayton, Mayor. They had good wind down there. So, uh, so it's a real pleasure to be here. But I think, I think the real uh, piece for us is there's a, there's a couple of points I'd like to make. And the mayors have done... Great work. It's, I, I enjoy this job so much, frankly, because I get to hang out and learn from other mayors, this, uh, the folks that are most passionate in government, I think, and the most serious about making a difference and getting things done. Uh, I think that uh, what Mayor James said about uh, our legislators really attacking local government is something that we see across the country right now. Uh, you know, we know as mayors that, you know, 92% of the job creation and the economic impact comes from cities, comes from those regional centers. And right now we have legislators that, and for example, in Ohio, come from uh, some real rural places that don't see that if you don't invest in those core communities and don't invest in that density, we're not going to keep great people like in this room in our cities, right? So... That's a big issue when we're talking about some of our cities in the Midwest that we continue to work on about this idea of shared prosperity. We really, uh, in Dayton, you know, we're the second most affordable city in the country behind the city of Indianapolis. Uh, we don't have an affordable housing problem. We do have a job problem. And so we do a lot of effort on trying to really work on innovation, making sure that those jobs that are creating wealth are staying in our city and in our community. Uh, secondly, this education issue is, is a big issue for us in the urban core as well. 
uh, in Dayton, just like uh, Mary James, we've said on a couple of uh, pieces around uh, early education, and we're real passionate about starting at the beginning of the collective impact model, which is what we call it, uh, making sure that if we invest in young people at the very beginning, in the first thousand days, uh, when they're age four, that they're ready to go to kindergarten and we can continue to work up the model. Uh, I think for us, uh, most mayors don't control their schools. Mayor Bowser does, I think, right? You're so lucky. Uh, in Dayton, we don't do that. So we really uh, invest around where the other 16 hours, 15 hours a day that uh, children are, and that's in their homes. Uh, making sure we can provide books for the summer slide, making sure that we get them to school earlier, that we invest in children across. And I think policies that are universal are really key to the shared prosperity model. Uh, if we just say, oh, we want to do something uh, for poor kids, it's not as valued if we don't do it across the whole spectrum. Because if everybody, everybody wins when, uh, when they get to go to pre-K, regardless of income. Now, poor kids do a lot better in it, but Wealthy kids do better when they're in, in, in pre-K as well. And so it, I think what's key on this shared prosperity discussion is that the conversation has to be about universality. And that will allow more people to use it. It will be more effective in our cities. We'll see more shared prosperity across it. And that's where government makes a great difference, right? Because the universalness of these programs are so key to the future of our city and our country. So mayors, uh, you know, you all understand the value of economic prosperity, creating opportunity for all. Uh, how do you make that happen? How, what about the politics? Uh, Mayor James talked about the legislature is not a friendly uh, group of legislators, not making the right investment in the city, uh, of his city, and that at the end of the day, mayors have to have the ability to work with everyone. Uh, you can't escape making those decisions. Uh, so how do you get it? How do you how do you make it happen? How do, from Washington? There's gridlock here. Uh, they get to vote and go home, but at the end of the day, you still got to work with all the key stakeholders. How do you make the political process work? And I'll give each one of you about uh, a minute uh, to answer that question, so we can get some more questions in. Yeah, I, I think the, the the key moment in Oklahoma City's history when we figured out um, the secret to economic development was when we realized it was really about the quality of life in our community. In the 1980s and 90s, we were struggling through a depression in the oil and gas industry. We spent a lot of time and effort trying to incentivize big businesses to move to Oklahoma City. And at one point, we thought we were going to get this incredible uh, maintenance facility by United Airlines, and they famously said they just couldn't imagine their people living in Oklahoma City because the quality of life had, had diminished so much. So the mayor at the time, um, a visionary named Ron Norick, um, passed a quality of life sales tax. It was a, a five-year sales tax of nine um, amenities to it, a penny on the dollar sales tax, uh, no bonding. We paid cash. The tax would end at the end of five years, and it has transformed Oklahoma City. We literally have gone from perhaps the worst economy in the country to perhaps the best economy in the country in a span of 25 years. And when we realized that that, that jobs didn't follow, that, that, I'm sorry, that people didn't go to where jobs were, that if you would create a city where people wanted to live, jobs would come to you. And that has, has been the, the, the success and the, and the model that we've been following now for, for over 20 years. Um, and it, it's why we do so well on typically the metrics that, 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 uh, that compare one city to another on, on, on uh, jobs and, and economic development. Well, we, we are unique, uh, I think, in the American system. Um, the District of Columbia is a city, a county, and a state all at once. Um, the difference being we don't have any representatives in Congress uh, who can vote. Um, so we have a non-voting delegate, and we don't have any senators. And it's uh, really it's a travesty of our democracy. Um, so everybody from other states, uh, we, we have to work on that. Uh, but to, to your point, we have a legislature uh, here, a city council of, of 13 people, uh, and we are fairly ideologically similar. I think most of the councils in the history of the district's home rule and the mayors 
haven't been that philosophically different. Uh, so the things that, that we will differ on uh, will be how to do things, not if we should do things. And so that, um, that's, that's a good, a very, very good thing for us. Uh, we are more recently having debates over the balance, uh, how much we ask the taxpayers for and how much we, uh, we invest in the things that I talked uh, about earlier. And, but even, even those debates, um, you know, our, our, our voters and taxpayers are also pretty um, similarly um, th thinking um, that we, we have to have an equal balance so that we have the economic engine churning. Just last year, for example, we lowered taxes in the District of Columbia. Uh, and, you know, our business community thought that something like that could never happen. Uh, but it was important that we send the message and that we be a city uh, that attracts business. Uh, and that will pay dividends in the end uh, because, again, people will continue to move here, businesses will move here, uh, and we can make um, the investments um, that are necessary. I really couldn't agree more uh, with what Mick said about making a, a city livable. Um, and part of that for us uh, was the, the real robust investment we made in schools. Um, and about eight years ago, uh, our new mayor at the time, in 2007, uh, went to the council to uh, take over the schools. Uh, and he won. He won that battle. And it was one of the most significant things, I think, that happened in our city uh, because there's a single line of accountability. It's the mayor through the chancellor um, reporting to, to the city council, uh, which has given people the confidence uh, to come back to our schools. Uh, we've seen for the last five years more and more people coming back to um, the public schools. And I tell um, my council members all the time, because now we're getting in debates now about how much is too much money to spend on schools, believe that or not. Uh, but we do spend a lot. Um, and it is important that we actually see results um, for that spending. And you know if you have any discussions around urban education, while we're getting results, they're not overnight. And they will never be overnight. Um, but we have to have um, that sustained investment. A um, couple of things. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with uh, the mayor about schools. Uh, most mayors that I know uh, would love to have control of the schools. And I would recommend, if you have not read, uh, that you pick up uh, The Education Mayor um, and, and read that book. And I think it lays out the, the argument for mayoral control of school districts quite well. Um, on the gap, the earnings improprieties and inequities, we passed as a city, uh, much to the chagrin and hatred of our legislature, a minimum wage hike across the city, uh, $13, because we could not get the political uh, backing to support 15, and because 15 probably was not appropriate under the circumstances in Kansas City. It's hard to say the 15 works in San Francisco, and you know, I have the same 15 in Kansas City, because the cost of living is certainly not the same. We did pass it, and it was a very contested, arduous process. Uh, only to have it just basically wiped out by the legislature, and then to have the city threatened uh, because of what we had done. They simply don't like us to do things that help people. <laughs> Imagine that. Um, well, that's the politics of it, right? That's the politics of it. So how do you it. work through that? Your goal is to improve the quality of life for everyone in the city, no matter what side of town you live on. And so how do you deal with that to make sure that the residents know that you're doing your job and you're moving the ball forward to help that kid who is homeless to close the education gap? What's been your, I'll give you another minute and then we'll move on to the next mayor. Uh, what's, what's been your strategy? How do you get it done for the students here? How do you make that happen? In Mayor Bauer's case, she has a city council that uh, has, that's their system and it's not a legislature. But I would also go back to you, even though with the council, you still have that uh, opportunity gap within the district. So uh, in terms of the balance you said you're doing. But, Mayor, how do you do it? You can't, you know, how do you make it happen? There's no way that you get anything significant done unless you engage all of the necessary stakeholders and talk about it for a long time. Can you tell us who the stakeholders are so we'll know? Just well, it depends, it depends on the issue. In the, in the issue of, of wages, it was minimum wage workers. <laughs> it was minimum wage workers, 
Uh, it was um, uh, people who pay wages, uh, restaurateurs, uh, businesses, hoteliers. And we met weekly, twice a week, for two, three hours at a crack. And some of them just evolved into outright arguments about their needs and our needs. We ultimately got to a point where the, uh, the uh, employers agreed that there was a need to do something. The workers certainly agreed with that. They were less inclined to agree on the levels that the employers wanted to do. But then we saw something phenomenal happen. We saw some employers voluntarily raise the wages. And it was all because of the conversations and the collaborations that came out of those weekly meetings. Uh, we could not get it done on a citywide basis. And frankly, frankly, doing it on a citywide basis, particularly where we're situated as Kansas right on a, a mile away and, and all sorts of suburban cities, that's not the way you really want to do it. It needs to be done on a state level so that it's uniform and there's no ability of businesses who don't want to pay it to escape elsewhere. But we couldn't get it done on a city level, but we had employers who stepped up and did it on an individual level. So we know that there's a desire out there and there are good people who will do it. So Dayton uh, is a, a progressive uh, liberal city surrounded by John Boehner's house district. So uh, you can get a good idea of uh, Southwest Ohio. And uh, uh, one of the things uh, that I did was uh, for our legislature was to do these legislative roundtables uh, of, of legislators that don't even represent the city, right? So they might be a suburb of the city. Uh, they might have some areas around it because our economy is connected, uh, and had meetings with them three times a year. And I know this sounds like, yeah, duh, but you have to put a lot of time into those efforts, right? And what I noticed was uh, when they would come down to Dayton, we had about eight of them, uh, the first time and the second time, I mean, they really did think that I was just some crazy-eyed liberal, right? Uh, but the longer that they took the meetings, and they kept on coming back, which says a lot about them, too. They just kept on coming back, wanting to know more. Why does the city think this is a value? Why is this, and we have, why is this investment needed? And we have found places that we can come together, right? So uh, I think one of the key strategies is, uh, and this can get very frustrating, right? Because you can get your uh, feet knocked out of you pretty fast in the state house. Uh, is to try to find those places where you can have common ground. Uh, the challenge for us as mayors is like, mayors are this, I think, uh, it is the hardest job I've ever had. Uh, the work time is, you know, 24-7. Uh, your frustration level, you know, the patience, I mean, we're human beings. And so to keep on going back to legislators to re-talk, uh, you can get really frustrated in it. And I think that you have to, really temper that as, as a mayor, right? Like, why don't they just let me do my job? Uh, so that's the challenge. I think that's the challenge that we have. And we have to, you know, do our very best at leading in a place that, fr quite frankly, all other areas of politics are not doing a very good job of leading in this conversation. And so I think that it's, it's an example issue we have to do, and we have to continue to work across. I, I've been surprised. I've gotten to work with some of the uh, really most extreme, I perceive them as the most extreme on the other side in our state. And, and they've even said to me, like, Nan, you know, I can't believe I'm actually working with you, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's a, and I, that's, that's a piece of success. Mm -hmm. Now, it takes them, like, this is what I noticed. It takes them, when they come to Dayton from Columbus, it takes them, like, 20 minutes to remember they don't hate me. <laughs> uh, just because of the partisan nature yeah. of the legislature these days. And uh, then after we get through the 20 minutes, we can have like a really good conversation. But again, what are we talking? We're talking about a lot of time. And I think that that's the frustration we have in cities uh, when we have you know, really tough issues. We're working on the ground every single day. And we really want people to let us do our job. But we have to do this work mm -hmm. of constant community building and legislative building around that. Yeah. Um, so we want to leave some time for a Q&A session with the audience. But before we do that. Um, I I want to hear from you all. You know, we're we're on a college campus. Um, Georgetown University has an advantage of being in the heart of DC. We have a lot of opportunities here. We have access to a lot of high-profile leaders. Um, I want to hear from you all. The other, the kind of the other side of the Institute of Politics is public service. Um, and I know at McCourt, and I think it's widespread at Georgetown that we have um, students who have come from backgrounds like 
Teach for America, Peace Corps, public service is very much at the heart of, of what we study here. Um, but I want to hear the pitches from you as to why we should not be seduced by the lure of the Hill and of the White House. Why should we go back to our communities? Why should we go back and work in city government and public service um, in, in local, local communities? And I want to start with, with um, Mayor Whaley because she, you went to the University of Dayton, correct? I did. Go Flyers. And, you sta <laughs> yeah. and she stayed there. And so I want to hear from your experience. And I want to hear your all's platforms. I want to hear your pitches to us as to why we should go back. Well, let me let me say this. I'm from Indiana originally, so I'm a very big fan of Midwestern values and Midwestern uh, uh, ways. And so, you know, when I crossed the state line, I thought my parents were going to have a heart attack and not being a Hoosier anymore. But uh, uh, I want to say I, I I think you know I had a I had a decision in 1999. I just graduated from college uh, to come to D.C. Uh, and work for uh, the DNC, uh, and all my friends were moved to DC because I was active, active in politics. And uh, I knew that at that point, that that was a big decision for me, right? I knew because I had no family in Dayton. Uh, I was the only person there, wasn't related to a soul. And I knew that if I left Dayton, that I would never come back. And um, that decision right there, I was like, I knew that was a core piece for me. And the reason why I stayed was I just knew I could make a much bigger difference on the ground in a city. Uh, now, I didn't even think at that time I was going to run for office, right? I was just working in government, working on campaigns. And I said, no, I have to stay here because I know that I can just make a huge difference locally. Uh, and that was a complete trend line that's against most folks, right? Most uh, young people uh, run to DC if they're interested in politics, run to the Hill, uh, want to be at the center of power. Uh, but I would argue that, that you get so much more done and so many more opportunities in your cities. Uh, the work that I've been, if I had, I mean, I look back now in 1999, I've gone to DC. I probably would have gone to do some really cool stuff and meet some famous rich people. That's true. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't get the opportunity to make a difference for uh, um, some of the seniors that live uh, in, my neighbor, in my neighborhoods. I wouldn't have the opportunity to have a 13-year-old girl come up to me and say, you know, your position on this has made a difference for my family's life. And if you're interested in public service, uh, you will not get that direct back and forth like you do on the ground in local government. Uh, and we need smart, committed people in local government, right? Because it uh, just, in all, in all sections of government, I think, but you will not get the response back. Now, it will wear you out, okay? <laughs> uh, there is nothing harder than, I think, uh, the local piece. And I had a, a friend that's a mayor of a city up in northeastern Ohio. I went to visit him. He was a state legislature, and he said, that was like pre-K compared to what I'm doing today. Mm -hmm. So this is hard work, but it is the most meaningful and makes the biggest difference in people's lives. And a, a personal experience, I wouldn't change a thing of it for not coming to D.C. No offense, Mayor Bowser. <laughs> Um, I have two former state legislators in my new council. I have nine new council people out of 12, and that's a lot of fun. Um, but they say exactly the same thing, that uh, they're working three times harder than they expect it to. Um, I think that there is value in going to Washington, D.C. and working in uh, federal government. There's value in going to the state houses and working in state government. Uh, there is value in working in cities. I think it really depends on what you want to do. Uh, if you want to engage in conversations about monetary policy and foreign trade agreements and uh, get engaged in long-term conversations about how many pages there really are in the Patriot Act and whether or not Obamacare should on the 99th time be overturned, <laughs> Uh, then go to D.C. and work in the Congress. Um, and you can have those conversations ad nauseum, and you can look just like everybody else. You'll learn the knuckle point, and you'll get your hair to a position where it doesn't matter how hard the wind is blowing, it simply won't move. Um, you can go to the State House, where you can become a D.C. politician in training, uh, where you get to argue about things, and you can be very partisan, and you have uh, um, a legislative body that presents you uh, pre-written legislation that you can sign off on because they're doing it in all other states. Our legislature was so lazy at one point that they took legislation from Illinois and adopted it in Missouri and forgot to change the name. <laughs> you know, it was, it was really sad. If you want to have real conversations about with your neighbors about 
Uh, my trash isn't being picked up. Uh, my streets need repair. My kids' schools are not working the way that I want them to. There's too much violence on the street. How are we spending our money? What does development actually mean for me? How are we going to erase poverty? Then the local level is a good place to be. All of them have value. It depends on how you want to spend your time. I chose, and others obviously chose, to spend their time working every day with the people that we see in the cities that we love. Everybody on this panel loves the city that they're at. This isn't, we don't go someplace else at the end of the day. We are in our cities, and it doesn't matter where we are. People come up and talk to us about the good, the bad, and the ugly. And believe me, they are not bashful. They are not bashful. They will get in your face. The reason that I think local government is good for me is because every day I'm held accountable. Every single day. I'm on Twitter today getting people... On the one hand, I get 20 tweets about how great the snow has been removed in Kansas City, and then I get three people that are telling me how rotten of a person I am because the snow's not being removed from their streets and it's icing up. And, and that's you're here? And, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I thought, and so I yeah, mistakenly he's, said, he's well, you can... <laughs> that's your Friday. Hey. <laughs> Friday, Saturday, By the time I get home, it'll be gone. I'm not going to worry about it. <laughs> I got a city manager. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Go for it. Oh, uh, for me, um, I love local government, and I think that each of you will have to decide, uh, to the mayor's point, what it is you like about serving. Um, and I think, for me, I had a couple of questions to add, answer in that in that way. I was a legislator, and, and now I'm an executive. So not only do I love local government, but I love being on the executive side right, right. Uh, of local government, because that is really where you can you can make change. Um, you are also, uh, there, there are two sides to it. You get to make the decisions, and you're accountable accountable for all of the decisions that you that you make. And some that you do. And some. I heard um, one of the candidates the other day, he was asked a question about why something didn't work in his state. He was a, in the, He's in the legislature. He's a senator. Uh, he said, well, don't ask me. Ask the governor. And I said, oh, I can't believe. But that is, you have to, if you like to make decisions, you want to be held accountable for the good, bad, and the ugly, uh, then, then the executive side uh, is for you. Uh, I, I tell the story frequently. I had the opportunity uh, to hire a lot of people when I, when I became mayor last year. And because we're in Washington, I have a lot of competition with the Fed. So I have this conversation all the time um, in recruiting. And more and more people see that they rather be in the local side of things than the federal side of things. And I had one person who had a, a offer at the White House, and I was making him a very significant offer too. Uh, and uh, he told me that at the end of the day, uh, he, had, uh, he had helped me negotiate a contract with the agency director. He had helped us cut a deal with a major league sports team. Uh, and he had the opportunity to weigh in on 70 executive appointments. Uh, so you won't have that opportunity um, except at the very high levels uh, when you are talking about the executive side on the federal level. Um, and certainly uh, you don't have that side, on uh, that, uh, that opportunity on the legislative side. So I think you just have to decide uh, what, what your passions are and what you want to do and decide about your, your trajectory. How are you going to get there? If young people ask me all the time, well, how did you become mayor and what should I do? And I think, quite frankly, some of the best ways to learn um, is to, to find a, a local candidate that you believe in and watch the whole process from, from beginning uh, to end. You also get to know a, a lot of really great people. Volunteer at some of these places. Volunteer with your, your congressman. Go and see what you can do um, uh, with your mayor or council person so you can see all, all sides of, of the government. Um, and then you're going to make some, some other decisions. And I promise you, I pay much better uh, than, the, than the Congress. And so if you want to, uh, I do. I'm very competitive. Uh, and we, we don't want you to go to work up there. We want you all smart, energetic people that care about how, how to build a great nation's capital um, to look at the District of Columbia. <clears throat> Well, I, I know a lot of people that are in Congress, really smart people. And I, I think most of you that are considering a career in, in government, it's because you want to change something. You're not, you're not wanting to be in government because you want everything to stay exactly like it is today. And, uh, you know, the people I know in Congress just bang their head against the wall in frustration that they can't seem to have a real meaningful impact. They can't change things. 
Um, we don't have that problem. We will never wake up saying, I just don't have the power to change things. We have that. We, ha we have that political uh, inventory. Um, we have that political capacity to, to work with our city councils and to have meaningful change in our communities and live long enough to see it. So, um, uh, it, you know, no branch of government touches people more quickly or more intimately than city government. And so, I, you know, it's still your perspective, but uh, boy, I, once I, you know, once I started watching city council meetings as, as I, I used to be a journalist, I thought this is where the action is. <laughs> this, this is where the citizens are standing 10 feet away from their elected officials and letting them know what they think. And that didn't happen anywhere else. And I think before we wrap up here today, we wanted to open up the a few questions to the audience. Um, so I think I think the mic in the middle is meant for that. Um, but if we could get anyone interested in asking our panel a question, if you could raise your hand. Andrew here in the front row. <laughs> I, I'm not going to make you walk over there. <laughs> you don't know, so you don't have to. <laughs> But um, my name's Andrew. I'm a second year student with Aaron at the McCord School uh, from Georgia originally, but a proud resident of D.C. for the last three years now. And I, I'm just kind of curious. Some of you touched on this in the theme. It's, it's a very common theme with local government, economic development. How do you bring businesses, <clears throat> manufacturing, high-tech industries to your city? I'm curious what you see. How do you strike a balance between robust economic development and getting stuck in a race to the bottom with slashing wages and throwing, throwing incentives, taxpayer money, at these companies to move in? Well, first of all, I think it's a misnomer to think that economic development means bringing something to the city. Economic development is a lot more basic than that. Um, our approach to economic development is developing small businesses into bigger small businesses or incentivizing and supporting entrepreneurism and creating an atmosphere where jobs grow. Uh, the other problem that a lot of people have with the issue of incentives is, is that we have what's known as TIF tax increment financing. There is no increment unless there's a project. So you're not throwing anything away because you don't have it to begin with. You have to have the project. The project generates the increment. The increment is then rolled back into the project to pay the expenses. That's how it's there. Our tax base today is the result of deals that were made 25 years ago, 23 years ago, and the projects rolled off and they're creating more taxes. And it's a competitive world. Uh, if you don't go after a business or if you don't incentivize your businesses, somebody will come into your city and they'll incentivize them to go to their city. So there's a balance, but it's I chafe a little bit at this throwing tax payers dollars away because we have a pretty good standard of living and part of that standard of living was built by economic development. One last point, our downtown starter streetcar line, we formed the TDD, Transportation Development District. In that Transportation Development District, since the streetcar has been announced, there's been $1.5 billion of real development, bricks coming out of the ground, surface parking lots being eaten up, new things coming into town, old things growing, and that's economic development as well. It's not taking any taxpayer dollars off. In fact, the property values of the property in the TDD have gone up so much that we have already funded our liabilities going forward and our um, maintenance funds for the next five years. This, this issue with manufacturing and tax abatements is a, is a very real deal, not just for locals, but the state government as well. So. Uh, just to give some of you some background on Dayton, Dayton's on the 75 corridor. I would argue during the Great Recession, Dayton had probably the worst Great Recession that corridor did. And without the auto bailout, uh, we would not be existing today because it saved the supply chain for automobiles and aerospace in, a, uh, in the Dayton area. We have 2,400 manufacturers in Dayton, uh, which, so uh, where to go, how much where to build, where to make things is a very big deal for our economy. It's around 18% of our GDP. So uh, for us, what we have found is that manufacturers prefer actually to locate along the corridor. And this is a bigger context than just cities. You know, this is where cities have to relate to the state as well uh, because of the workforce, 
right? This is a workforce that has been around for over 100 years, invested in making things. Uh, and that's uh, what, I, what I think we found with manufacturers is they see that and they can't just move it really quickly anymore. So our challenge, again, is goes back to the how we invest in pre-K, how we invest in our workforce, how we make sure that that, align, that pipeline's aligned to continue to make things. Uh, uh, for us, uh, you know, one of the things that makes me very uh, nervous is we have to have the manufacturing to have the innovation. It's connected. Uh, there's a reason why all this innovation came from the Dayton area was because we were creating those, uh, those items. And if we don't continue to invest in that as a, as a country, as a community, uh, uh, the Midwest is in really big trouble then because that's what we do. Uh, so yeah, so we have, the abatements do play, but what we've noticed is it's more around workforce development, more around, you know, what kind of worker and the quality of worker that we can get. Uh, and we have a really good story to tell uh, in the Midwest because of that. But it's greater than just a city conversation. Just to add on, it is greater. Like for, for us uh, in the, the Maryland, Virginia, Washington, D.C. region, uh, we're talking more and more about how we can be regional actors instead of single actors um, in, in those conversations with companies. Now, keeping in mind uh, that you have to overcome everybody's self-preservation right. and self-interest right. um, because I was elected to represent the residents of the District of Columbia. Um, but it is true that in a, in a kind of a, if we look at a, a long-term play, um, that we as a region have to figure out wins in the long term, not just on every single uh, deal. That's easier said than done, I'll admit. And so we are having some conversations, uh, the governor of Virginia, the governor of Maryland, and myself about the things that we can compete jointly on. So if we're um, competing for foreign investment, for example, uh, any foreign investment that comes into the region is going to benefit us. Um, and so one of the things that we'll do together, um, and we're working on a trip now to go to Canada to continue to uh, attract investment um, in, in, our, in our region. Um, so that's that's one particular thing around economic development. Now we are not a manufacturing city. Uh, we make uh, <laughs> information here, uh, and uh, our our big industries continue to be the people who work with the federal government. Uh, tourism and hospitality uh, continues to be a very um, big uh, area uh, for us, and also hospitals and universities are among the biggest employers in the District of Columbia. Uh, we do have more and more uh, uh, made in D.C. Uh, um, just products. Um, I don't know if you know what the number one it, product is right now made in D.C. is beer. Uh, so we have a growing uh, beer industry around our city. Um, and talking about uh, the Midwest, uh, a company has moved here who are very interested to see if they can introduce some light manufacturing in D.C. like they've done in Detroit, and that's Shinola. Shinola. Uh, so the, there are things that we are looking to because one of the key things, we produce a lot of jobs in D.C. We should have no employment, no unemployment problem. Uh, but we do um, because we don't have um, the, the, net, the, the skills for the jobs are very often high in white collar jobs. We, are, we have a number of residents who, who don't qualify for those jobs. So we need to produce jobs around the whole spectrum of skills. Um, and that includes uh, light manufacturing. So we continue to look for ways to do that. I, I think what we've learned is it's the quality of life is very important. You still got to have all the incentive packages, and we have ours. And specific to your question, I'll, I'll just rather than take up more time, I'll put in a shameless plug for a documentary I produced because uh, it's on this very subject. It's called Oklahoma City: The Boom, the Bust, and the Bomb. Just won a gold medal for best feature documentary in, in New York City. But it, it tells Oklahoma City's story on the incentives and what we've learned and how the city resurrected itself from uh, you know, some of the incredible catastrophes it's faced in its history. Uh -huh. Anybody else? Right there? If you, could come, if you could come up to the mic, I'm sorry. Yeah. I had a moderator. Anybody else, why don't you line up so you can, uh, once you get in line that way after you. Uh... Uh, so uh, actually, I just wanted to um, ask uh, the flip side of that question that we were just talking about. Um, I'm uh, Justin Brown. I'm a, a student in the Urban and Regional pl Planning Program, uh, graduate program, and a proud DC government employee. Um, the, uh, a lot of us are concerned about the trend uh, of those jobs. We talk about uh, jobs in education. 
What about the long-term trend of not needing some of these jobs and the rise of the maker movement and the information services economies and all these different things? How do you look at the long-term trend that maybe a lot of this manufacturing is drying up and isn't to come back um, and that the economy is changing and, and point of use uh, manufacturing becoming uh, a larger portion of the, uh, of the manufacturing uh, sector. So does anybody have any thoughts about that long term? This is, I'm going to have to say this is probably our last question. That's all we have time for before we wrap up. So I'm sorry that made you all get up and sit down. Yeah. I, I would just say, I, you know, I think the current trend is that manufacturing is coming back. But I, I agree. Long term, you can you can see the how we you know become more uh, IT reliant, and uh, you know you would think it would be more about information rather than than manufacturing. But we're seeing a lot of jobs that used to be overseas come back to the United States. That's a, it's a great trend for us. Right, which is the which is the point of use. I mean, I think you know still the United States is make making a lot because we use a lot still, I think. And I do think the makers movement is, I had one of the, my most favorite town halls was actually with the maker movement and the folks that are using 3D printing and uh, uh, innovating space. And we have a lot of contract uh, manufacturers. And so watching the two of them, we, we had a town hall where they both came together and witnessing how that could connect to scale uh, uh, the maker movement was a really exciting um, uh, thing to watch in Dayton, right? Because uh, that's something that we do really well. We scale uh, manufacturing and then this really uh, innovative space, uh, which which for the past hundred years, that's what Dayton has done, right? I mean, uh, I'm not kidding, from the Wright brothers in their bicycle shop, uh, making a glider that could fly, uh, to Boss Kettering, figuring out how to do the starter engine, uh, continuing even to the F7, uh, F-16, F-17 today at the Air Force and connecting those to, to scalability in our community. So I do think uh, manufacturing is changing dramatically. It is um, uh, very uh, heavy on how to be more energy efficient, how to use uh, uh, a very high skilled workforce than we used to have, which is different uh, than even 20 years ago. But, you know, we're still going to make stuff in this country. And so how we make it and how we use our workforce to make it, uh, I, I think, provides tremendous value. And frankly, I'm, I'm more pleased with uh, smart people getting into manufacturing than getting in, per se, the finance industry. Because, I mean, I don't really know what you make there. So uh, so I think that there's, there's great opportunity uh, in this maker's movement in connecting it to manufacturing. I think artificial intelligence and robotics will eliminate some of the lower-end jobs because it's more efficient for people. One of the things about this recovery from the economy is, is that employers figured out or thought they figured out, hey, I'm making more money without all these employees. Why hire them back? And that's been one of the lags on the recovery is it's a, jobless, uh, a joblessness recovery. So I do think there's something to worry about there. I wish I was smart enough to give you the answer. I don't have it. I'll, I'll just say this, that I think that your question ties into kind of the, the theme of today because one thing that we're looking at is for um, ways that people who are not going to easily enter the traditional job market, uh, finding ways to support themselves. Um, and when they can get into light manufacturing or creating this in this maker's space and becoming entrepreneurs, um, then they can um, be successful. Uh, so I think for us, that's even though we're not a city that is going to be a, a large manufacturing hub of any kind, we, we are going to produce some smaller, lower um, level manufacturing. We're interested in it for um, that returning citizen who's not going to break in um, to the traditional job market or for the adult who is low, um, low reading skills that we have to work into the traditional job market. So we want um, to look at it just like we, we look at tech, quite frankly. We approach uh, tech in the same way, uh, that we just don't want it to be the high-end white-collar worker, but we want to expose uh, tech and, and light manufacturing uh, across our city. We call it, we are eight wards here, so we have an all eight ward strategy so that we can we can get people um, in into productive, good pay, even if they're not going to break into the, to the traditional job market. Um, is there anything? That ends it for today. Thank I think you, we're everybody. Out of time. Thank, we're thank you. Thank you. Yeah.